Foundation, the largest European nonpartisan think tank here in town. And today we have the honor and privilege to host today's event in cooperation with the Council of Women World Leaders at the Aspen Institute, represented today by Elliot Gerson, who is the Executive Vice President of the Aspen Institute. From here you will hear later. Today we have the honor and privilege to welcome a woman, a socialist, separated, agnostic, <laughs> all sins together. You can relax, this is not my definition of her. This is how our guest of honor describes herself. And ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the former president of Chile, Michelle Bachelet. I think this applause shows that President Bachelet is one of the most outstanding leaders and politicians of our times. She became the first female leader in Latin America when she took office in March 2006. But I think she has defined in many ways throughout her political career how female leaders find their role in politics and how dedicated and committed you can be once you have a public role and are serving your country as we have seen throughout the tragic earthquake that hit Chile in March this year. President Bachelet has come to DC this week to participate in a high-level UNFPA meeting to discuss maternal and reproductive health issues. A pediatrician and epidemiologist, uh, she also served as healthcare minister of her country, but at the same time, and this may come as a surprise to you, she studied military strategies. And that led to the fact that she also served as the first female defense minister of her country. And I also think studying military strategies equipped her perfectly well for all those political fights in the political arena that you have to take up from time to time. President Bachelet successfully transformed her country into a very prosperous economy that also led to Chile's OECD membership at the beginning of this year. And under her leadership, I would say the country has also managed the financial crisis among only a couple of other emerging economies pretty well also thanks to the savvy management of Chile's sovereign wealth funds. Needless to say, there would be much more to add but time is not on our side today. So I hope I left you all curious to learn more about the president's mission right now after she has left office. And to do so, we have invited Julia Schweig, who is the Nelson and David Rockefeller Senior Fellow for Latin America Studies and the Director for Latin America Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations. Julia is a historian, and she has become a leading voice in this country to explain Latin America to politicians, political advisors, but also to the broader public. And she has published widely on the issue and her latest book, Cuba, What Everyone Needs to Know, has received rave reviews in uh, last year when it came out. So from our point of view, she is super qualified to moderate the discussion with President Bachelet this, this afternoon about lessons of leadership. And I'm sure I'm not the only person in the room that has noticed the inflation of the term leadership in recent years. Uh, everybody is asking for leadership uh, from the Starbucks baristas up to the president. We expect everybody to lead. But um, from my point of view, only management guru Peter Drucker really got the term leadership right. And I have to quote him right now. Management is doing things right. Leadership is doing the right things. So with having said that, President Bachelet, we are all curious right now and eager to receive your definition of the term leadership and how you would further develop the term leadership after you have left office right now. So ladies, warmest welcome to you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, 
that was a superb introduction. Thank yes. you very much on both of our behalves. I was telling you before we came out, President Bachelet, that you have a huge fan base here in Washington, D.C., and I'm sure this is just a small percentage of, of the people that, that will um, really take away a great deal from your answer to the first question. But before we get to this definition of your lessons learned from leadership broadly, just tell us a bit about why you are here this week in Washington. Well, um, as uh, Annette said, there is, uh, uh, for three more days, there is this uh, conference of uh, uh, global leadership and women delivery. And it's related, mm, this is a, it's a conference, the first one was in 2007 in London. And it, it deals a lot with women empowerment, with women health conditions. And of course, right now, when we have in front of us a huge task, that is to meet the goals, the Millennium Development Goals. And uh, maternal mortality is the worst of all. Uh, it has advanced much slower than the rest. And it's only five more years when we should uh, meet this goal. So the idea was to put together a lot of people uh, just uh, before September, where we'll be, there will be a, a in, in, in the General Assembly of the United Nations, there will be a special session on Millennium Development Goals but to, to discuss, to diagnose and discuss why maternity, matern, maternal mortality is, has been advancing so slow, uh, what are the political, economical, and social conditions that should be, and what are the solutions for women and girls in the world? And that's the main issue. And for me, that's very important because uh, when I was president of the Republic, I lunched with the Prime Minister of Norway, Jan Stoltenberg. Uh, there was this uh, leaders, um, I would say, league uh, supporting the struggle uh, for MDGs 4 and 5, that is maternal uh, mortality and uh, infant mortality. And as president of Chile, I launched that uh, initiative in Latin America, f first in, in South America with the countries that have the, the, the worst indicators in this area, that was uh, Paraguay, Ecuador and Bolivia, because we have had a very good results in, with oral health and public policies. We were working with them, training them, uh, finding the kind of problems they had to see how they can really meet the goals in 2015. So that's the main reason I was in Washington. Of course, I've had thousands of other meetings and things like that, and I'm leaving today. That's why we don't have very short of time uh, back to Chile. But uh, I believe very strongly that uh, our, our, our world cannot accept the situation of women and children that we see in so many parts of the country. And if I have uh, had my, my historical background, if I had the privilege to be the president of Chile, and I, if I have the honor to be well known in many places, even in Washington DC, that's amazing for somebody <laughs> coming from Latin America. I mean, I, I think I have to use, if I may call it that way, this political capital uh, for the benefit of other people and for the benefit for my people in my country, but also for the benefit of many people who are suffering in the world. In this case, we're talking about women and children. In other cases, uh, I would be also very involved with um, uh, international labor organization on all and, and WHO in all uh, social cohesion, uh, social protection programs, because I believe without crisis, but especially within the crisis, you need not only to save banks, you need not only to try the economy to get uh, invigorated again, but you also need to have very strong social protection plans. So you won't, uh, you, a, a financial and, 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 and economical breakdown would not, or collapse, would not be followed by a social collapse. That would be a very bad thing for the people, but also a very bad thing for uh, global governance. So uh, that's another issue that I develop a lot in my government, but I believe we, 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 I, we show that it could be done. Uh, you don't have to make a trade-off between economic growth and equal opportunities. You have to do those both things, and that's what people are expecting from their leaders. Let's, go, let's stay in Chile for a second then. If we were having this conversation on February 26th, 2010, the day before the earthquake hit, Chile would have been um, coming out of a brief um, recession caused by the global financial crisis, but already begun a substantial recovery. How do you, 
how do you explain Chile's ability to, to survive the global financial crisis? And how have those structures that you had in place helped to deal with the aftermath on the social front of the earthquake's impact? Well, I would say that uh, there was one problem we did not have. It, it was the financial problem, because in the 80s we did have a, a financial collapse. And then we introduced the, all the regulations to the, to the banks, limiting the risk. So we didn't have more than a general global impact on mm -hmm. some uh, industries or banks that have had you know, a strong relation with, 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 with other international right. financial yeah. institutions. We did not have much impact. But we did, of course, have the great impact of not having credits and loans because, well, nobody was having it. And so for our economy, it was a, 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 a very complicated. But what we decided, first of all, we started looking at the signs. I mean, we started having mm -hmm. a, an impact on the, on the housing issue of the United States because we, as a very globalized country, we have more than, we, ha we have signed FTAs since we recovered democracy for more than 56 countries. We have FTAs uh, with special um, uh, systems with uh, 3 million 500,000 people. I mean, the market is 3 million 5,000 uh, people. No. Three, 3,000 million, sorry, 3,000 million. Billion, three, 3 billion. 3, tri three uh, trillions, yes, uh, 500. Um, so we did really um, have a, a great opportunities on that. I mean, our relation, our trade, free trade relation is with 80% of the GDP of the world because we believe that Chile, as a country of 12, 12 million inhabitants, when we recover democracy, would not depend its it's a leap to development on internal market. We needed to open the country, the economy, but also we were very isolated politically after the military regime. So we needed to, uh, to start doing a lot of things. So we did have the impact on our wood industry. We sell at 80% to the United States. So when the housing issue came with the bubble and also it came here, we, we had a, a big impact. But afterwards, of course, the crisis uh, produce a lot of direct impact or because of expectations. Nobody would move and nobody will invest. So we had a lot of problems. So we will, we were reading the signs and we decided to, to do like a, a fiscal plan very, very, very soon. Mm -hmm. And in January, when, when the crisis was not still very important in Chile, we developed a, 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 a stimulus plan, a fiscal stimulus plan, uh, looking to develop the economy. I mean, we're not giving money to the banks. We were giving money to, to the, I mean, we were giving, um, it was the fifth uh, fiscal plan re, um, according to the IMF, uh, as huge in the relation with its GDP. Of course, $4,000 million for you maybe is nothing, but for Chileans GDP, it was the fifth in the world. So we, uh, we, invest $700 million in infrastructure. We, 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 I mean, in anything that will produce jobs, will move the economy. And uh, also we gave a lot of money for credits and loans for the SMEs, because they are the ones who usually cannot have, uh, don't have access because they are so seen as risk partners. The small and medium sized yeah, enterprises. Yeah, small and medium yeah, yeah, enterprises, yes. Uh, we did, we did have a problem, and I, I understand in the United States the same happened, that the demand, the, con the um, consumers did yeah. not consume, so we did give them, the people, um, money, I mean bonus, in the worst moment, so they can also consume, but also we believe that, because we believe on equal opportunities, that poor people, vulnerable people, could not pay the party. I mean, they, they weren't invited to the party of the crisis, and why should they? pay the consequences. So we, we did a, a very important plan considering every issue, but on the other hand, we, we, we have been very responsible when the two first years of my government, copper prices were so high and everybody was pushing me to put everything on the budget. But I decided to have very good budgets, very expanded budget, but on the same hand, most of this money, or some of this money, went into this sovereign funds. We copy, if I may say, the Norwegian model, 
with the oil funds, and we did it with the copper. So what happened is that when we had the crisis, we knew what we have to do, and we have the money to do it, mm -hmm. because there's lots of countries who knew exactly what they have to do, but they didn't have how to do it. So and why I'm telling you, because when I make the decision, everybody was pushing me against it, Everybody was telling me, no, you have to spend all that money. You will be much popular. Those were very tough years, <laughs> those two years. I have made some decisions that weren't the wisest, or they didn't work as I wanted to at that time. I'm talking about transport system. It was a, really <laughs> a problem. And some other issues and, and, and problems. So everybody was pushing so hard. But then I decided, no, we need to keep something, because uh, there are good times, and we, have, and we need to, because we are doing some reform, like pension system reform. Um, and, and we knew that we have a very high expectancy of life. People is like today 78, 79% women, 81, 82 men, a little bit less, 76, 77. And we knew that in, what, 10 more years, you know, the active sector will be even smaller or will cross the passive sector. So how we deal with, uh, improving rights, improving benefits, but to, I don't know the word in English. Is it the word in English, the saco plate? No, the saco plate. It's to, uh, the couple, the couple. The couple, the, the, the benefits with the economy. And the best way to do it, to have good reserves, to have these funds. So when there were bad times in economy, we didn't have to uh, reduce the benefits and the rights. So, we not only help the economy, but also maintain and improve uh, the social benefits so people would not suffer in this huge condition. We also, before the crisis, uh, improve our um, social security, no, um, unemployment uh, uh, insurance. insurance. And also we develop uh, a lot of laws. For example, we had a problem with young people, uh, labor participation. We had the highest rate of unemployment in, in women at the beginning of the government and in young people. So we develop a special incentive. We pay every, for every worker, every uh, 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 industrial man or 30% um, of, of the salary. So 10% will go for, to, the, to the industrial, to the businessman, and 20% to the, to the young worker. So the worker will have a better salary, and the, but it had to be a formal, formal job, everything mm -hmm. formalized, and the and the uh, businessman will have the in incentive to formalize young people and to uh, have more f young workers. So I just mentioned small things, but we did a lot of things, and of course we also did a lot of things regarding women, because we had a lot of women who want, needed to work but didn't have to do with them, with the children, talking about poor women. Of course, professionals, me, has always had the possibility of having their children at, at paid nurseries or kindergartens. So we, uh, we multiply for five times the nursery and kindergarten facilities, I'm talking public free of charge for women in, during my uh, four, uh, four year term because we believe that women has to have uh, more choices and more opportunities. Did that boost the number of women work in the workforce, it did. in the formal sector as well? It did. When I arrived to office, I think the women participation was like 38%, and I, when I, 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 I finished, uh, it was 42%. I mean, of course, it's, we need to go further, but in four years, I think it was pretty much. The, so but that's because of my own experience. I studied mm -hmm. at the university, and I work with small children. And I learned the obstacle for women who work who, so with little children. So I, I decided to do, introduce all these kind of, uh, of uh, I would say, policies that will help women to, be, to improve their lives and to, to be economically empowered and to be able to, to, to give their children also the best. The earthquake. Oh, yes, I forgot. Took that. about 20% of Chile's GDP, as I understand it. Now, these, the, the financial stability that you had in place prior, that I assume has helped mitigate some of the effects, at least pay for reconstruction. But describe a little bit, if you would, the, the, how you see the country recovering from the earthquake, where the difficulties will be. Um, I know it was a, just in the last few weeks of your tenure as president. 
Yeah, that was the last 11 days of my, my presidency and there was uh, intense really. But the worst thing is that uh, it, it was uh, not, not only a, um, an earthquake as of a huge magnitude, 8.8 .8 Richter, but also it was so extensive because mm -hmm. in our Chile's history, we are, we are an earthquake country, we, we know that. And the worst earthquake known is uh, in Valdivia in the 60s, that's 9.5 Richter, that's the worst known. Maybe there were other worse in the past, but we don't know that. And, um, but this was 8.8, .8, but it, it was extended to six regions of the country where 80% of the population lives. And, and so it had a terrible impact on people, on, on, on productive sectors too. And of course, uh, at, the, at the beginning, and still I would say, the main issues were shelter and providing food and now how you reconstruct uh, the productive issue and how you reconstruct the country. Uh, in Chile, because we have all this, I would say, uh, fortress uh, or, 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 or strong issues, uh, we can deal with reconstruction, we have money to have it, or if money is not enough, because a huge reconstruction probably it won't be enough. We have low risk, and we're a low risk country, we are, we are creditors, so we can have also, I mean, if we need some loans and, and, and help, we will receive it. But the thing is that, as I see things, we have to reconstruct the country after earthquake, not as it was the day before the earthquake, because many of these regions are regions who were very vulnerable, who had a lot of uh, some uh, high uh, unemployment rates. So we need to look at all these capacities that the country have, and to step one, I mean, go one step further to organize better those regions to produce some incentives so the economy on those, on those places will go much better. And I also believe that the reconstruction has to take into consideration how, what I could say, I mean, everybody thinks of infrastructure, building you know, gates and building uh, schools and hospitals and houses, but still we, we think it's needed to to have a lot of productive reconstruction and how we uh, help, for example, the, the fishermen that lost all their or engines and the boats and so on, but also a psychosocial dimension. Because uh, unusually, governments don't look at psychosocial dimensions because it's a huge, so huge program, problem that it's, it's, it's less, uh, uh, I would say, uh, considered, taken into consideration. Mm -hmm. So in my foundation, we want to work on those issues too trying to develop a model of intervention, because it's different Haiti than Chile. I was going to ask you about Haiti. You visited Haiti yeah. just after the earthquake there as well. Yeah. What's the, almost impossible to compare, I would, I would guess, but tell us what you took away from that visit and, and how you see things uh, evolving there subsequently. Well, well, Haiti has been having a lot of, I mean, has the great challenge of consolidating institutions, and they were in that trend, and dramatically the earthquake meant not only the loss of a lot of uh, economical uh, capital, the loss of uh, a big amount of people from the bureaucracy who were learning to do things in, in, in the, in the uni united and, and professional way, so it is. It, it, it was. A, it, it's a terrible impact because a country who was so weak with an earthquake like that gets weaker and weaker. You know, and it's it's so difficult to to stand up. I mean, in Chile we have a lot of problems, but we know we will stand up mm -hmm. and as quick as possible because also people is very resilient, and as people is very resilient, then we, we are used to get up again. I mean, we had a political history was difficult, and we learned to get up and stand up and. And, 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 and we have learned that when we work together, we will have bigger success than when we are uh, divided. Of course, paradise doesn't exist in Earth, and people you know, have all the conflicts, normal conflicts in politics, all the normal conflicts in, in society and in, in life. But still, we, we, we have this sense of, of unity, of solidarity that is incredible. And I, that will help. So I would believe that the main issue in, in Chile, uh, in favor of us, is that we have solid institutions 
And not only I'm talking about national government, also regional government, but also, and very important, mayors. In our, in our, in, we, we have municipalities where mayors have worked with the, with the firefighters, where they work with the, what every civil society organization. In those places, when it works well, those uh, places are getting, standing up faster than other places where the mayor don't believe in participation of the people, where they don't have these like emergency committees that work for it. So I would say lessons will be that uh, institutions, solid and strong institutions is very important. Second, I would believe that it's very important people's participation. And I was talking to you how in Chile and in Haiti, women are so important in reconstruction. And men here will have to forgive me, but that's, that's the truth. And everywhere I went, I mean, everywhere they were developing shelters, they, oh, men and women, uh, voted for women to be the organizers, the leaders, and they're still there. I've, I've been visiting them, very low profile, uh, to see how they're doing. They know I cannot give them money and subsidize, but I, I'm, I go to see them to see what's going on in their lives. And they're very active there. In Haiti, women are relevant, but unfortunately, Women have not, I mean, women's organization, when I went to Haiti, I went, of course, I had meetings with President Prival, Prime Minister, and so on, but also have a big meeting with women organizations. And they are wonderful, and they know what to do, and they're working there, and they are also in the shelters. But the international community is not giving them, funding them, so they are able to do the things. So if I can say to somebody who can make some decisions, please help women organization in Haiti. They are really relevant to the reconstruction of Haiti. And in Chile, uh, they are working. They also need, of course, help. But they are organizing themselves. So I would believe institutionality, uh, people participation, and of course, resilience. I think it, it's very important because people are not used to suffer. But uh, I mean, it, it's nothing so n unusual in our country. Just to expand beyond Haiti and Chile, but to stay in the Americas if we could. Um, they're, they're today, uh, Secretary Clinton landed in Ecuador and she's going to Lima and she'll go to Colombia. Um, the Americas is a, a, an opportunity for the Obama administration, in my view. Um, you've been working very effectively in the region, not just within your own country, but in helping to construct new regional institutions as well. Um, you were the first chair of UNASUR, for example, during the crisis in Bolivia. What advice do you have, not just for this week, but generally speaking, for the issues where Washington can work with Latin America on the issues that Latin America itself is most focused on? What are those issues and where, where can real partnership potentially evolve? Well, the main issue, I would say, or recommendation is have a bigger um, involvement with Latin America. I mean, still in Latin America, we feel that we uh, are, <laughs> I mean, we feel and we know uh, that I mean, Latin America is not a priority for, for, for US. And, and, I'm, and I understand because US plays a major global role so you have to deal with Middle East, you know, you have to deal with, and it, it's signing with Russia, you know, this important agreement regarding, you know, uh, weapons and so on. We understand that. But the problem is that people believe that the uh, United States looks at Latin America when we are in trouble. But when we have, uh, but on the other hand, if you look at who, what is Latin America now, uh, Latin America has been, I would say, in a gold, era last eight years. I mean, Latin America is growing. Latin America took 30 million people of, out of poverty in, in five or six years. Um, and, and related to the uh, international crisis, Latin America uh, had a, I mean, behaved much better than other regions and is now recovering. You know? uh, economies could, could have been uh, very uh, with, with a lot of consequences, now they're moving. So I would say uh, 
Many times uh, Latin America is looked like a trouble, like a problem, and then you are concerned with it. But when there was, it's, we're working well and we're doing good, it looks like it can be forgotten. And even well, that's though... That's a badge of honor, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, I'm, but I want to tell you that uh, when President Obama went to Trinidad and Tobago to the America Summit, and I was the chair of the UNASUR, so I organized a meeting with him and all the 12 presidents of, of, of South America, and we had a great meeting. And everybody fall in love with him because he... No, no, but I'm telling you that because... And I mean everybody. Huh? And I won't go into the detail, but everybody was... And <laughs> just, just check the press clips to see who was there. And, uh, but because he told us what we wanted to hear, of course, huh? is that we wanted a partnership relationship. Hmm? Uh, but it happens, and I, I, I might say this, maybe I shouldn't, but it, for different reasons, I won't make any comments about that. It took some time until Senate defined who will be the person in government in charge of Latin America like one year, I think, or eight months or something like that. So I think this honeymoon that was created, I mean, if, if we had had immediately the response, it would have been a little bit more, you know, I would say more everything smooth and everything like a continuation, but because like it was great, but then not much happened. But, but Secretary of State Hillary Clinton has been doing a lot. She's been working, creating this network of social protection and energy and green recovery is one thing in the agenda. But we think we must think in other issues and other interesting issues for, for the region. I mean, of course, tackling poverty is one of the main issues, but also is innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, modernization of institutions. And I think there's a lot of much work we, we should do together. I mean, Latin America and United States. Too bad you crossed paths in the air with Secretary Clinton and her trip to the south and your trip north. I'm so sorry about that because I have a very good relationship with her. Yes, um, well, I'm sure she'll look to your advice or I hope that she will in the future. What are the, you, you mentioned very briefly at the very beginning of our conversation, the World Health Organization and the ILO. Um, and those two, those two in the same sentence as global governance. We're clearly in a moment right now internationally in which the multilateral institutions that we created after the end of World War II are in need of and being renovated. Um, speak a little bit about the, those two institutions or any other in terms of rewriting the rules of the games on the global stage of those institutions and, well, and how you, you plan to participate. Well, I think that if crisis, economical crisis, but let's not forget that before the economical crisis and financial crisis, the world was having, at the same time, a little bit before, the food crisis and the energy crisis. And, of course, climate change. So when you see these three, plus economical crisis, what I say, we have having a problem with governance of the 21st century issues. It's not only, they're not separated. I mean, there's something going on. And I believe that in some way, there hasn't been in the world, the political, I mean, I'm talking before, not just regarding the crisis, the, the economical crisis. The political will to make the renovations and the modernizations necessary uh, in order to cope with all these different crises that they are showing there is a problem, mm -hmm. a structural problem, and how we're dealing with those global issues. Because it's not one isolated issue, it's many things that are showing there is a problem there. The second thing I think it's necessary to, to be taken into consideration is that the world has changed, uh, and, and leaderships have changed. And, and you cannot consider multilateral institution the way we considered that after the Second World War. It was great after the Second World War, but now the, we, we have different powers in the world, and you have to consider that. I mean, you, you cannot have, I mean, Brazil is a, a, a reality. 
is a huge potence, it's playing major roles, and it has to have the representation in the multilateral institution that it should. And I'm naming Brazil, but I could, I could name uh, India or, or China or whatever. I mean, there is a world that's different. Power today is differently represented in the world, but it's not represented equally or, or, or balanced at the multilateral institution. The third thing is that we have to find out what about financial multilateral institutions have to mm -hmm. renovate and, 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 and see things. So the problem is that we deal with problems of historical problems like poverty, inequality, discrimination, but also m new things. And, and my impression is that we haven't been able to, to uh, still, I hope, well, what the G20 is doing have some results, but uh, still, I believe it has been a little bit slower than it should. And sometimes when you read magazines and so on and articles, you realize there is a group of people saying, you know what, let's hope this old stress for the crisis passes and then we go back to do business as usual. And the main lesson is we cannot do business as usual. We have to really consider this, not only this crisis, all the crises, like a like a terrible threat and, a, and an important sign to tell us you, we cannot, as a world, continue the, doing business as usual. And that has a lot of consequences. I know President Obama has spoken a lot about green recovery, but, 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 but I mean, really mean that if we don't really see that this is not isolated situations, there is a bunch of crises, and in the future can come other, a new, new others, um, we might be I would say not doing what we have to do, and is to um, to make the decisions that will assure the world that the world will continue improving conditions for all its citizens, or at least trying to do it. We are able to take a couple of questions from the audience, um, and I, I think what you're supposed to do is just raise your hand, and somebody will bring you a microphone, bring a, the microphone to the audience. Um, yes, please, right here in front. We have about 20 minutes for, for questions and answers, and then I'll wrap up. Uh, hi. Thank you very much. I'm June Zeitlin. I'm with the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights here, trying to get CEDAW ratified by the United States. But my question to you relates to work I've done previously with Carmen and many civil society organizations at, in New York on the gender equality architecture reform campaign. And as you know, there's been a movement over the last few years to strengthen the, um, have a new women's agency at the UN, and I'm wondering what your views are on it, and in particular, as I'm sure you know, many civil society organizations and governments have recommended that you're exactly the kind of leader needed to get it off the ground, um, and I just wondered um, if you could comment on that. Oh, my God. That was a direct question, huh? <laughs> Everybody today has been following me, trying to know something about it, and something people try to do the indirect question, and you just get it into my throat. <laughs> what a, what, how refreshing. <laughs> well, um, I, I, I would say that I think it's very, I mean, I, I think it's great that women and gender issue will be considered with the relevance that we'll have if you have a structure, a common structure, that could produce the synergies between the different agencies that today in the multilateral systems are working with women issues. So I think as an idea, as an initiative, it's very good. Uh, I, of course, uh, structures are important, but more important is what are you going to do with the structure? And, and I'm, I'm not informed as well as that to, to, to know if it goes in the, in, the, in the right way. But the first thing is that women exist. And I think that's very important. I mean, exist in a high level with a high profile. And I think that's great and that's important. Uh, and I think that, um, but the thing is that I hope also not only this new architecture will have the important task that it, it needs to, to have, but also it has the funding. Otherwise, it will be music. And I love music and I love to dance, but for solving women problems, you need to have enough funds. So it won't be only a, like a message and nothing else. So it will be very discouraging for women in the world 
to believe that this could be a difference, a major step, and nothing happens. And I'm telling you this because of the experience with the women organization in Haiti. Everybody loves them, but nobody gives money. So that's the sort of thing that's important for anybody that could decide to go into some position, to know if it's something that will really mean a difference or not. That was a very direct answer to a very direct question. Um, yes, um, yes. Thank you. Um, something that you didn't touch on is the, what we in America call the green economy. Um, in your stimulus package, did you and do you have investments that are continuing to build the economy with so-called green investments, renewable energy, leveraging your forestry issues, et cetera? Yeah, well, I didn't mention directly, really, because I didn't go into the detail of all the stimulus plan. But before the crisis, we were working on that very hard for two reasons. First of all, because we, we do believe that climate change is a reality, and we wanted to uh, play our part. We are for the NAMAS, you know, the national uh, uh, programs uh, for mitigation. And uh, within that, we have been developing a lot, a lot of incentives for renewables and for um, uh, many different uh, sources of energy, yeah? of clean energy. Also, but also not only because of climate change, but also because of very domestic practical issue, that Chile is 70% imports, 70% of its energy. And uh, we have had problems in the past, that sometimes, because of many re reasons I won't go into the details, we did not receive the, the energy. So what, as, as soon as I arrived to office and I named a woman minister of fine, um, mining and energy, afterwards I named a special minister of energies because the problem is so, so big, um, I told her that we needed to develop a, a, an energy policy, a new energy policy, where we should take into, uh, to, we had three objectives. The first was to, to diversify our, 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 our energy providers and sources. So we should um, have the, some, I mean, we could be sure that we will have the energy we needed. Uh, second, uh, we, um, we were going into new ways and uh, renewable so we could deal with climate change. And third, we develop a very strong program about energy efficiency. That was very good. We had great results. Um, and uh, so, of course, during the crisis, and right now when we're talking about reconstruction, green economy and green re recovery is very important. And we have been working on developing, uh, and of course I'm talking about, for example, biofuels, biocombustible, but second generation. I mean, not, not uh, touching food, but yes, grass, or, or from wood, There's a, or bio, um, bio energy, or uh, um, geothermal energy. We're working on all of those stuff. And of course, we have the driest desert in the world, the Atacama Desert. So we're working with the United States, with California and other places developing uh, uh, solar energy uh, uh, research and, 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 and a hope production afterwards because we have a great, I, I think, a great opportunity in solar energy. I mean, we don't have oil. I mean, we have, but very few and, and many other things. But we do have water, so hydro energy is very important. We have geothermal because volcanoes. We have, I mean, we don't, I didn't only have an earthquake. I have a, three earthquake volcanoes and, and so on during my government. So, uh, I, I mean, that's very bad. That is a good thing uh, regarding energy because we can have a lot of uh, uh, different possibilities in energy. So, uh, definitely, it is a very important issue before the crisis. And, of course, when we are going to reconstruct a society, a country, we need to include this point of view. And it is being included in the uh, energy plans. And, but we did it before. When I was um, president, in the housing, social housing uh, plans, we incorporated, uh, for example, uh, solar and, uh, how you say that? Um, mm. Well, energy system in order to warm the house or, and to have electricity too. It's, it's, it's very expensive for electricity, but it was less expensive for, for warming and warming, you know, given warm water and warming systems. So 
we were working on that as, as, as government before the crisis and before the earthquake too. Did they have a job created? Oh, I, I, w I would be lying to you. I, I don't remember really in this minute. I cannot remember. Yes, over here. You'll have to excuse me. I need to take a moment. Le agradezco mucho por estar aquí. Siendo chilena americana es muy importante para mí. Muchas gracias. Gracias. Um, I had a question about, um, you brought up innovation and entrepreneurship. And uh, excuse me, my name is Ruth Sandoval. I'm with Domino 12. Um, I, I, if you had the opportunity to have a conversation with 40 of the Latino multimillionaires in the United States uh, to engage in a dialogue about entrepreneurship and innovation, what would be the three things that you would like to tell them? Uh, well, I, I don't think there's so many, so much original issues, but I would say the first essential issue is education. Because in order to, I mean, not only access to education, but also how we assure quality of education. I think one of the main challenges of many countries, and not only Latin American countries, European countries, probably here in the United States, you also have the, the challenge of quality education. Uh, and if that education is, excuse me, to use the word educating uh, children in order to uh, be creative, to be, I mean, to be an innovator, you need to be creative. You need to, to, to be able to develop very free way of looking things. Because otherwise, I mean, if you only are, look at the very normal, traditional things, how can you be creative on the other hand? So, but on the other hand, and, and you have to find out in education what the problems are. For example, in Chile, what we did find out. We did find out that we hadn't enough uh, professional, good qualified teachers in three uh, relevant areas for innovation, math, biology, and, uh, well, English, because the world is globalized and we need English. So I would say education is essential and everything that can be done in order to have the best uh, educational system, public and private, best education is essential. And not only university, also what some people call technical or vocational education, that's essential. But linked to that, and we did that in, in the government, we, you need to uh, be able to make this sort of uh, look at education and everything within, with innovation in a PPP uh, way of doing things, private-public partnership, and with universities and academic centers. So we need to produce this synergy with all this uh, system in order to, to see uh, what is necessary to innovate. In, in Chile, we developed an innovation council, and we, did a, we defined five clusters, that nationally, five clusters. But then we work with every region, because you have different uh, productive possibilities in every region. And we then define, and we gave money to the regions to define specific clusters, for, for example, of course, mining clusters, as always, but uh, to be a food potent, we work a lot also on wine, of course. It's one of a very important thing. But also, uh, I mean, we uh, off, um, offshore, offshoring, because Chile is a country, for example, we have brought a lot of Indian companies to Chile because they are interested in a serious country, but on the other hand, they need the time zone to work with their American clients. So they mm -hmm. could do it from Chile into the United States. It's easier, uh, less expensive, and they could have, but we need it, our people to know English, so they can you know, all, do all these things. So I would say it's very important also to identify uh, which are the uh, opportunities that, that not only nationally, but also uh, uh, regionally. And third, I would say that it's very important for a country development that you produce the, um, in these clusters, that you produce the integration when big ones with smaller ones. Because that is what will, first of all, I don't think the United States is different than other countries. I mean, SMI, SMEs, small, medium enterprises, produce more jobs, 
sometimes than huge uh, uh, industries because they're so sophisticated and technologically sophisticated, they don't need so much my people. I mean, we have some energy plants in Chile that, you know, it's so modern, all the equipment that you need for workers to, to deal with it. Uh, so, um, so I would say that, but also I would believe that, um, that, um, that they should work with the government in order to create the incentives. So innovation would be something that, uh, for example, incentives uh, for each, how could I say it? I mean, it's not exactly the number, but in Chile we pass a bill, uh, it's a law, that for each uh, uh, dollar for to say something they expand the private sector spend the state will put uh, like the, the half of the money one on one and something so it will create incentives to to really produce more innovation in in areas where it's needed yes thank you so much my name is Jihan Deng, and I'm with the South Sudan Mission here, the Government of Southern Sudan Mission to the U.S. Uh, thank you for your elaboration on uh, the importance of a strong governance uh, and institutions. However, I would like for you to elaborate a little bit, especially with the fact that Chile had political differences and problems in the past and has overcome it. Uh, most of us know that Sudan is going towards a very uh, significant period with the referendum taking place in January uh, 2011. So what would, you be, would be your advice to, to help, not only with the political transition, but the economy? As Sudan has undergone civil war for the last two decades, the economy is very weak, but there is a lot of natural resources there. So how do we only, not only just strengthen the, the governance, but also trans, transit from humanitarian aid to encouraging SMEs and, and others to strengthen the economy. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I, I, it's not an easy question because probably I will win the Nobel Prize, Peace Nobel Prize if I answer it, but I'll try to do my best. Um, probably one of the most difficult things when you need to, if I may use the word reconstruct a nation as a nation, is how you build confidence. Because if there's no confidence, uh, whatever one, pe one party says, it's like, you know, marriage discussions. When the woman says something, the husband understands something completely different, and there's no possibility of communication. And I'm not trying to joke about that, but I mean, it's really very difficult, and one of the things in conflict resolution and that you have to read between lines. But when you're talking about a nation who has been so divided for so long, and there's a lot of suffering there, a lot of pain, it's not easy. But on the other hand, it's a must. I mean, you need to do as much as you can to be able to be a country when you, where you can live together. And then, the political sector has the responsibility of creating the conditions so people can live together. I'm not an expert in Sudan, even though I know a lot of things that have happened there, to give concrete suggestions. But I would say anything that can be done to build confidence. So confidence, it's important. And there are lots of things that can be done there. But first of all, there has to be a political will and a political commitment that you need to go further, do you need to, to, to be able to have a new government with a new plan for the citizenship, so people would really, and that will include political issues, social issues, economic issues. Um, there are different forms and ways of doing things, and that's what I'm telling you. <clears throat> I don't know the exact situation right now of Sudan to, to tell you specific things, but <clears throat> for example, well, sometimes people can, are able to get together and to define how they're going to build a peaceful society. Sometimes that's not possible, 
and you need a third part that can help in that sense. And it's, there are many experiences in, in the country, but that the party has to agree with that. I mean, when sometimes, and sometimes the United Nations has been working on that, helping, you know, or mediators or, or, or special envoys and so on that can, can help uh, create these conditions. It's, I mean, it's, 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 it's sometimes very hard. And sometimes the solution is a coalition, I mean, a united government for some time. And, and that's what I'm telling you. I don't know exact situation right now, so I cannot say exactly what's the best, what's then. But I think the responsibility of the leaders is to see, well, do we believe we can live together? Or we need to live together? So how we do all, use all our efforts in order to find the kind of government that will assure that. And I'm telling you this experience. And the second thing is, in my experience in Chile, you have to go gradually. You have to put goals that you can fulfill. Because otherwise, achieve, that you can achieve. Because otherwise, the expectations are terrible, and, and you won't go as fast as you like, and then people will be discouraged, or people will believe that this new system is not best, better than the other one, and they can go back to conflict, to war, and so on. So, Okay, so you, you are talking about the hypothesis of a separation. Okay, well, I think that um, what you have to do that is, and, and, and probably if that happens, there will be a lot of help with multilateral organizations in order to make a very good diagnosis of the situation of the country, what, uh, what the problems are, what the capacities are, uh, is there, uh, necessary uh, professionals that can, you know, I mean, most of these things need also technical uh, 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 management and experience, know-how, how to govern, how to, uh, to know about the economy. So you will need uh, to have the human capital to be able to, to govern the country and to be able to analyze which is the best options for the economy how you deal with uh, natural resources, how you deal with uh, education, how you, um, how you, what is this kind of leadership that can help um, uh, producing uh, community participation and so on. Uh, but I think, uh, uh, but I think it's, I imagine that people who want to separate the nations uh, has already studied the country knows what can be done. But uh, if it was not that situation, I think there will be help of, of many multilateral organizations that could uh, try to uh, not do things for you because the people have to do the things, but wor walk with you while getting out of that terrible situation. President Bachelet. I have one final question before we end this, and it's much less complicated than the question that, that you just gave such an eloquent response to. And I know you've been health minister and defense minister and president, and you have many careers ahead of you, but are you considering writing a memoir? I have. Excellent. I have. We will look and forward uh, to I that. have, you know, all my notebooks. Uh, like 40 notebooks because I'm very like good students, you know. So every meeting I write everything down. Well, the historians in the so, room will look forward so to So I this. I keep it very carefully next to my bed. No, because I, some people, <laughs> under the mattress. Some Locking. people would like to destroy it because okay. <laughs> because uh, you know there are memories and memories that you There's can some great that you can stories do. there. I yeah, suspect. great stories. No, but I will. But you know why? If, um, it's, it's, Fundamentally, because there hasn't been too, much, too many women president and ministers of health and, and, and defense. And I have to say something, not because I want to say, oh, come on, guys, look, I was the first minister of defense in the Americas, not in Chile, in the Americas. United States and Canada had never had a minister of defense. <laughs> and, 
But as I say, it's contagious because now we have in Uruguay, in uh, Argentina, in uh, and Spain, of course. I was thinking Latin America. In, 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 in the Nordic country always had, you know, the, those are the first ones. <laughs> And but uh, you know uh, but uh, but I, I I believe that uh, <clears throat> there are much more than now. But um, you were oh I lost where I was going. Uh, Your memoir. Oh my memoir. Yes. yes. You were you were going to. Spend, I was going thinking. I was enthusiastic take, about women in defense. Exactly. So. <laughs> no, no. But women, you, you, the fact that you are a woman is a very big deal. Yeah, having done well, this. So you're going to write about that, that as well. Yes. And when you, Annette, spoke about how I describe myself, it's not how I describe myself. It is that when some people ask me, you with your history, how you deal with the commander in chiefs, and I said to her in this first meeting, immediately I started as direct as you were. And I said, you know, okay, guys, I know I'm a socialist, I'm an agnostic, I'm a divorce, I am, uh, what else? A woman, of course. <laughs> So I have all the things that you can imagine, <laughs> but I can assure you will work wonderfully. That's why I always tell this, this anecdote because I, and, and they laugh at that, but, I mean, but they were, but, and, and I could develop a wonderful relation with them because I, always, I also know a lot about defense. And, and I studied defense because I thought that in countries like Latin American countries, uh, political, political uh, people never got involved in security and defense issues. And there were needed counterparts that could discuss with them, not not the very technical issues, but also also technical issues. I mean, if we're going to buy, buy fry gates, why should we buy superficial fry gates or what kind of fry gate? So I studied that, and as a doctor, I'm I'm um, I always study things to try to understand them, not to be an expert. I'm not a neurologist, but I could understand what needs to be done, and I think that's something very important when you have to to um, direct something, to be in charge of something, to be, not be superficial, to get into the deep stuff, and to go to the big picture, but also to some details. And when I was Minister of Health and I went to visit a hospital, I did not have only a meeting with the director of the hospital, and went there into the, um, uh, uh, how you call that, subterraneo. Uh, the basement. Basement, basement. And I've been speaking English for the last 48 hours, so I just forget everything. In the basement, to speak with the people who, you know, make the cleaning, for the people who make the, the milk for the kids, and, and to know exactly what's going on. And when I was Minister of Defense, I got into the, uh, I mean, to, to the place of where people were, you know, uh, in the very worst conditions, to understand in the skin what means to be there, you know. When you understand in your skin what's going on, you can have better decisions, you can make better things. So I will write my memoirs, but my memoirs will not be only a summary of facts, but also will be linked with the kind of leadership that I think should be the new uh, renovated leadership in women, but also in men. And because I believe that that's probably the main uh, interesting thing that I could share with people. Now, not, you know, telling who was who and who would try to kill me and not. I mean, politically, <laughs> politically speaking. Uh, not, not those sort of small talks, but, but more the essential issues that I think could be of interest for, for, for people. Well, you'll have lines around the block to fit the book signing when you come to Washington again. We have, uh, we could keep you for two more hours, but your plane leaves in yes. two hours. Yes. So I know that we'd like to um, just say a couple of words of, of closure before we let you go. Yes, please do take, take very careful uh, attention about those notebooks <laughs> because it's going to be a great bestseller and we all look forward to, to reading it. Uh, on behalf of the Aspen Institute and our Council of Women World Leaders, I'd, I'd like to thank you for your insightful and inspiring observations, to, to thank uh, Dr. Julia Zweig for her uh, skillful moderating, uh, to thank uh, our friends at the Bertelsmann Foundation and, and Anat Heuser in, in particular uh, for co-hosting this with us. It was very, very clear listening to you today, President Bachelet, uh, just how much better the world would be if we had more leaders like you with your values, your priorities, and your wisdom, and I think quite significantly of your gender as well. And we thank you very, very much for being here.